The sun, beyond just giving us life, as if that's not enough, it also puts on incredible solar shows like eclipses and flares that can trigger geomagnetic storms. It's home to temperatures we can't comprehend, and it's the biggest nuclear engine in our corner of the universe. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium. In this episode of Perspectives, several experts discuss some of the marvels that make our sun so incredible. We start now with an account of where we'd be without the sun. Enjoy. The sun is by far the biggest and most massive object in the solar system. In fact, at 99.9% of the total mass of the system, you could say the sun is the solar system. The rest is just a wee sprinkling of dust surrounding it. Just try to imagine what would happen if we magically removed the sun from the system. Darkness would reign, temperatures would plummet, and planets would all go flying off in straight lines from wherever they were in their orbits. But the sun's importance goes even further. Without the sun, the planets would never have formed. The planet formation process relied on dust and gas being confined to a disk orbiting the protosun. That disk formed because material was collapsing onto the protosun. Thankfully for us, some material had a bit more rotation, making it end up in a disk orbiting around the sun rather than onto the sun itself. The sun is an average sized star, which means that it's a large sphere of mostly hydrogen and helium. Actually, stars such as our sun that are at least second generation stars, and that means that they formed following the supernova explosion of at least one previous star, have compositions that generally resemble the average composition of the Milky Way galaxy. A composition of the ordinary matter of the Milky Way, not taking into account strange stuff like dark matter and dark energy, is 74% hydrogen, 24% helium, 1% oxygen, and everything else, rocks and metals, makes up the last 1%. The composition of our sun is about the same. We are taught in an early age not to look directly at the sun because of the potential damage to our eyes. Luckily, solar telescopes can photograph the sun through various filters in different wavelengths of light. When we choose a particular wavelength of light to study the sun, we are looking at different parts of the sun's surface and atmosphere. The wavelength is related to the temperature, which is related to specific parts of the sun. For example, The yellowish light we see in the visible part of the spectrum comes from the opaque surface of the sun, where radiation has a temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin. We would have to wait until the early 20th century for Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation to tell us that matter can be converted to energy. That's what happens at the center of the sun. The pressures and temperatures are so high in the center of the sun that hydrogen atoms are squeezed together, fusing to make helium atoms. All the energy we are getting from the sun comes from nuclear fusion occurring in the sun's core. This is possible because the four hydrogen atoms are slightly more massive than the resulting helium atom. The difference in mass between one helium and four hydrogen atoms is converted to energy. That energy equaling the mass difference times the speed of light squared. The inner 25% of the sun converts over 600 million metric tons of hydrogen into helium every second. Temperatures need to reach about 14 million Kelvin in the solar core for fusion to ignite because the hydrogen atoms have to have enough kinetic energy to overcome the repulsive forces between them. It's this fusion that makes the sun a star rather than a planet. The magnetic field of the sun holds crucial clues for understanding solar activity. If you've ever heard about sunspots or a solar flare, then you have some familiarity with what solar activity means. Sunspots are cool patches that sometimes appear on the sun's surface, showing up as dark spots thanks to their lower temperatures. We think that sunspots form thanks to the sun's tangled magnetic field lines. 
To understand how this happens, take a look at the Sun with standard magnetic field lines drawn, connecting its north and south magnetic poles. It's a simple illustration, and the magnetic field lines look nice and neat, but we've forgotten something. The Sun spins. It also spins at different rates, with the equator moving faster than the poles. This varying rotation distorts and curves the Sun's magnetic field lines. You can try something similar by picking up a piece of string and twisting it between your fingers in opposite directions. Eventually, you'll see twisted loops pop out of the increasingly twisted string. Those loops that you've made are a pretty good representation of how the sun's magnetic field can cause sunspots. Those magnetic field loops will sometimes protrude through the sun's surface, producing cool spots where they poke through, which we see as sunspots. This is why sunspots tend to come in pairs. You'll see one spot associated with the end of the loop that's closer to the northern magnetic pole, and another for the southern magnetic pole. The number of sunspots on the sun's surface increases and decreases on an 11-year cycle. The sunspots themselves make very little difference to anyone on Earth. They have only an extremely tiny effect on the sun's brightness. So the solar cycle won't have any impact on things like our planet's climate, and could never cause something as severe as the climate change we've seen in recent years. Still, solar activity is worth understanding for another reason. The solar activity cycle also correlates with the number of solar flares and coronal mass ejections that we see from the sun. Solar flares are eruptive events that release light and charged particles, spectacular events that, if they're strong enough, can disrupt satellite communications. Coronal mass ejections have the potential to cause even more problems. These are explosions of material in the sun's atmosphere that can send massive blasts of particles from the sun's corona hurtling toward Earth. Solar astronomer Richard Carrington recorded an immense burst of solar activity in 1859 that became known as the Carrington Event. He first noticed a large number of sunspots on the sun's surface, followed by an enormous geomagnetic storm. At the time, the telegraph was the most widely used form of long-distance communication, and the storm was powerful enough to wreak havoc with the system. Some telegraph operators were shocked by their equipment, and communication towers hurled sparks. In desperation, some operators turned off their haywire equipment, only to realize that the telegraphs kept working even after being unplugged, suggesting that an eerie amount of charge was still present even in the ambient air. Now, imagine something on the scale of the Carrington event happening today, in a world where we're incredibly reliant on satellite communications and electronics. Even with solar astronomers closely watching the sun, we wouldn't have much warning, and there's not much we can do. Currently, emergency plans focus mostly on what to do in the aftermath setting up emergency equipment to get our power grid back up and running. Until we can predict events like this well in advance and execute emergency shutdowns to keep our satellites and electronics safe, we're stuck with watching and waiting. When solar eclipses occur, parts of the Earth are in the moon's shadow. Now, because the Earth is much bigger than the moon, a solar eclipse doesn't happen all over the Earth just at a single location where the moon happens to block the sun. It turns out that solar eclipses can be quite different depending on where the moon is in its orbit. This is because the lunar orbit has a bit of an ellipticity to it. So there are times in the moon's orbit when it is closer to the Earth than others. This ellipticity is very small and hard to see if you draw the moon's orbit to scale but it does make the measured extent of the moon slightly bigger or smaller in Earth's sky. At its closest point to the Earth, known as perigee, the moon measures about 12% bigger compared to when it's at its farthest point from Earth or apogee. Full moons at their perigee are sometimes called supermoons, whereas full moons at apogee are called micromoons. And these small changes make a big difference when it comes to solar eclipses. When the moon is at apogee, 
it can't fully block out the entire sun. All we get is what's called an annular eclipse, where even the most complete coverage still leaves an outer edge of the sun exposed, making the sun appear like a, a ring around the moon. We only get total solar eclipses when the moon is close enough to Earth that it can block out the entire sun. During its 10 billion years on the main sequence, the sun's mass loss has been and will continue to be quite low. It has lost only a hundredth of a percent of its mass over the past 4.6 billion years. That works out to an average mass loss rate of one Earth mass every 150 million years. This mass loss is driven by the solar wind emanating from the sun's outer atmosphere known as the corona. Relative to the bright disk of the sun, the corona is very faint. It is only visible to the naked eye during the few minutes of a solar eclipse when the sun's disk is completely covered by the moon. Since such events are rare, the corona was a spectacular revelation to many Americans when the solar eclipse of 2017 crossed the United States. The solar corona has a temperature of 2 million degrees Kelvin and a density that is just one trillionth that of the sun's surface. The corona's hot, tenuous gas is an ionized plasma of mostly electrons and protons. It is heated by activity associated with the sun's magnetic field, such as sunspots and solar flares. Due to this heating, a wind of coronal plasma continually escapes the sun at a velocity greater than the speed of sound. At the 1 AU distance of the Earth from the sun, the solar wind has been measured to reach a speed of 750 kilometers per second. This high velocity wind slows to subsonic speeds when it begins to interact with the denser gas in the local interstellar medium. Similar to the flow of water around a source in a sink, this turbulent interaction region is known as a termination shock. In the case of the solar system, it is located at a distance of about 90 AU from the sun. A bit further out is the so-called heliopause, where the solar wind pressure has declined to the point where it equals the pressure of the local interstellar medium. Launched in the 1970s, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 space probes respectively crossed this threshold in 2012 and 2018 at a measured distance of 120 AU from the sun. Thus, the solar wind bubble produced by the sun currently has a radius of only two thousandths of a light year. In about five billion years, the sun will leave the main sequence as its core runs out of the hydrogen necessary to power its nuclear fusion into helium. As this now helium core begins to slowly contract and heat up due to gravity, it will ignite hydrogen fusion in the hydrogen-rich region around the core. This hydrogen shell burning will produce much more energy. In response, the sun will increase in size by a factor of 200 and become a red giant star with a surface temperature that is cooled by a factor of 2 to 3000 Kelvin. The outer atmosphere of such a huge star is cool enough for small solid dust grains to condense out of the gas. The star's gravitational hold on its bloated outer atmosphere is weak enough that the star's radiation pressure on these grains can push them into a slow wind that escapes the red giant with a speed up to 30 kilometers per second. The resulting mass loss drives these grains of stardust, along with some gas, into the interstellar medium. As a red giant, the sun will lose about one Earth mass every 300 years due to this process. Such a mass loss rate is 500,000 times faster than when the sun is on the main sequence. Overall, during its one billion years as a red giant, the sun will lose about 50% of its mass. Near the end of its red giant life, nuclear fusion will have left the sun's interior with a mostly carbon core, the size of the Earth, surrounded by a helium fusion shell, 
and a hydrogen fusion shell. The helium burning shell can have extreme fluctuations in its energy release. These fluctuations drive episodic thermal pulses that will eventually blow off the sun's outer envelope over thousands of years. During this time, the sun will lose mass at an average rate of one Earth mass every month. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.